Hello and welcome. My name is Martin Savage and I'm from London in the UK and it's my pleasure to have you with us as I chair this live webinar which we are recording from Seoul in Korea. I apologize for the technical difficulties but we're now ready to go and the title of this webinar is Short Stature Management and Growth Hormone Therapy in the Asia-Pacific region. Let me introduce uh, the faculty. We're all pediatric endocrinologists. Han Wu Kyu is professor at Asan Medical Center here in Seoul. And Mohammed Yazid Yalaluddin is a professor and the faculty of medicine at the University of Malaya in Kuala Lumpur. These are our learning objectives. After taking part in this webinar, learners will be able to debate the appropriate diagnosis and assessment of short stature, including the impact of nutritional status, apply strategies for optimal management of the different short stature disorders, taking into account comorbidities and factors influencing response to growth hormone, and assess the social and psychological impact of short stature in the context of emerging economies. And this is the program which we are going to uh, go through with you. We have structured this to be appropriate for the Asia-Pacific region. After this short introduction, I will talk about the diagnostic approach to short stature. Han Wook will follow me with talking about uh, heightism and the psychological burden of short stature. Yazid will then come on and talk about nutritional status in the assessment of short stature. We then come back to Han Wook, who will talk about growth hormone treatment of idiopathic short stature in a multi-center national study. Yazid will then approach uh, an important condition in this part of the world, which is thalassemia, the management of children with short stature and thalassemia. And I will give the final presentation on factors influencing the response to growth hormone therapy. And then I'm pretty certain at the end we will have time for discussion and questions. And we look forward to your interaction with us and we will do our best to answer your questions uh, during that discussion time. So as we move on further, some housekeeping announcements. Throughout the webinar, we invite you to interact by answering the polling questions, which you will see coming up on the screen, to send us your questions at any time using the box on your viewing screen. And also please complete the evaluation form at the end of the webinar. It's important to state that this program has been made possible thanks to an educational grant received from Merck KGAA Darmstadt, Germany. And here are the pre-assessment questions which uh, we're going to uh, use in order to measure learning. And the following questions will be asked now and then again at the end of the webinar to see whether you've hopefully been able to pick up some points clinically relevant uh, to the management of your patients. And the correct answers will be revealed during the post-assessment period. Okay, so, so let's move on. We've had the pre-assessment questions, and so now I'll go into my uh, short introduction, which is entitled <coughs> Diagnostic Approach to Short Stature. So the diagnostic approach to short stature, as we all know, Children with short stature make up the largest group of patients referred to us in a pediatric endocrinology clinic. 
These are my dis disclosures. And what we need to, to understand and what we need to realize as pediatric endocrinologists is that children with short stature make up a very interesting clinical group of patients. <coughs> They're all different. And here you see, for example, eight children. They all look completely different, and they have different causes for their short stature. And this just emphasizes how wide the pathogenesis is in children with short stature. For example, at the top, you have growth hormone deficiency, Laron syndrome, Noonan syndrome, and then a genetic defect of the IGF-1 gene. Then on the bottom panel, you probably recognize that you have a child with Cushing's disease, a child next to it with malnutrition living on the streets of Kathmandu, and then you have a child with Turner syndrome and Silver Russell syndrome. All these children look different, they have a different phenotype, and therefore they make up a very rich series of patients with a wide range of clinical um, information. So as you know, the etiology of short stature, as I've said, can be very varied. It can be developmental, environmental, genetic, autoimmune, endocrine, chromosomal, psychosocial, or often a normal variant of growth. And it's important at this point to remember why we decided to become pediatricians. We didn't decide to become pediatricians so that we could do a lot of basic science and be clever scientists. Actually, we, most of us decided to be pediatricians because we wanted to help children. And so we come back to our clinical skills, and we have to use our clinical skills when we assess the child with short stature. And in that sense, the assessment of short stature is more of an art than a science. So what is short stature? It's a statistical definition. Children are said to be short when their height is less than minus two standard deviations below the mean. And as you see on the top left, as the child becomes increasingly short, there is an increasing chance of finding positive pathology, which really causes what we call true pathological short stature. And on the right you will see the growth curve and essentially we we'll just remind you that although we usually in the clinic we talk in terms of centiles, we also in terms of research talk in terms of height standard deviation scores and the third centile represents minus 1.8 standard deviations below the mean. Now one of the first stages is engaging with a child with short stature is deciding which children have probably a normal variant and therefore may not need intense investigation and which children are likely to have true pathological short stature. And there are three auxological criteria to help with this. The first is the severity of the short stature itself. If the child is extremely short, it is likely that there is real pathology. The second point is very important and often forgotten, and that is the distance between the, the child's height, shown on the, on the, the blue uh, plotted line, and the uh, percentile that the midparental height comes back to. That difference is very important, and it's been clearly shown by uh, important work in the Netherlands that if that distance is more than 1.6 standard deviations, which is approximately 8, eight to 9 centimeters, then it is likely that the child has true pathological short stature and should have further investigations. And the third cause is if there is evidence that the child is actually growing slowly, and we take four centimeters per year roughly 
as the lower limit of no, uh, normal growth velocity in a three to 10 year old. Now, I'm not going to read through all this uh, slide, which shows the causes of short stature, but just to remind you that the <coughs> variants of normal growth are more common than the non-endocrine causes, and the non-endocrine causes are more common than the true endocrine causes of short stature. So we need to remember this. And because the causes of short stature are so broad, I think it's a good idea when we see a child with short stature to try to forget that we are endocrinologists and to approach the problem of this child who is short as a general pediatrician or physician and not as an endocrinologist. After all, we may be dealing with a completely normal child a normal child doesn't need a specialist. It's important to be a clinician rather than a technician. And my advice is, when you see the patient, look at the patient and not the computer screen. You will learn much more about the causes of the child's short stature. So we come back to the basic principles of clinical medicine. We take a history, we do a physical examination, we consider the differential diagnosis, we perform some investigations, and then we need to commit to a diagnosis. I'll come back to this at the end, but it is very important. We cannot leave the diagnosis open, up in the air, because only by committing to a diagnosis can we adopt a rational consideration of therapy. So we need to have a scheme and here, this uh, slide shows the scheme. We start with the history. We then go to the physical examination. And in that physical examination, the measurement of the child is of key importance. You have to be able to measure the child accurately. accurately. And basically, we need to know the parental height centiles, which we plot on the centile chart. We need to know the birth weight and the gestational age. And then we need to use our clinical skills to learn how to examine the patient to look for possible dysmorphic features. This is extremely important. It is our responsibility as clinical pediatric endocrinologists to pick up any abnormalities in the physical examination. Now, I mentioned the history, and again, this is a complicated slide. I'm not going to read through it, but I just want to make one or two key points. When you take the history, try to take the time to observe the child and the family, the interaction, while you are doing this. This is a very precious time. If you are too rushed, you simply will not pick up the subtleties of the psychological dynamics within the family. The second point is, when you're taking the history, for example, about the symptoms, gastrointestinal symptoms, ask direct questions. Don't simply say, okay, no gastrointestinal symptoms, tick. No respiratory symptoms, tick. You ask direct questions. What about... Uh, does he get abdominal pain? How many times a day does he have his bowels open? You will pick up uh, key clues to the diagnosis in this way. Does he get short of breath? Does he wheeze? Does he cough when he runs around? These are direct questions which are extremely important. So then we move on, and these are diagnoses shown on this slide, which we should be thinking about even before we come to any endocrine assessment. You should be thinking of celiac disease. You should be thinking of Crohn's disease. You should be thinking of a dysmorphic syndrome, such as Noonan syndrome, which, as you see in the bottom of these three photographs of children with Noonan syndrome, can be very subtle. But nevertheless, if you look at the child in a careful way, with, your, with the child's face straight opposite yours, you will pick up the fact 
that that child has mild hypertelorism and low ears consistent with Noonan syndrome. We should be thinking about hypochondroplasia, and we should be thinking about Turner syndrome. Some girls with Turner syndrome have very few stigmata of, of the syndrome, so we should be thinking about that. And then we come, as you see on the right of the slide, uh, to the question of general investigations. Now, this has been controversial. In 2008, we wrote this paper, Cohen et al., giving guidelines on general screening tests, which we would recommend for children with short stature. And this is something I've always done in my own practice. Before doing any endocrinology, I've done general pediatric screening tests, which include the carrier type and a celiac screen. Now, in 2013, a paper came out from uh, Cincinnati saying that these tests were a waste of time in most children with short stature. They were not cost-effective. I don't agree with that message. Personally, I think you, we need to use general pediatric screening tests. So having done that, we go on to endocrine tests. Now, there are a lot of different endocrine tests that we can use and we can rely on, and some are available in our laboratories, some are not. But there are two tests which are more important than any others. And the first is the growth hormone stimulation test. Of course, you only do that when you've excluded general pediatric pathology. But the, the growth hormone stimulation test is important. And the second test that's important is to measure IGF-1 levels. So... The growth hormone stimulation test has probably been criticized more than any other test in endocrinology because it is not physiological. It is not totally reproducible, and yet it gives valuable results. Of course, you should do the test in any patient who you think may have growth hormone deficiency, but a child who is short with a normal growth rate a normal bone age and a plasma IGF-1 level above the mean does not need a growth hormone stimulation test. So one needs to be selective about which children we do this in. But it will distinguish severe growth hormone deficiency from the child who definitely does not have growth hormone deficiency. And for that reason, it is of considerable value. Finally, IGF-1. Well, IGF-1 is a, a hormone, and its production is influenced by many factors. Age, general well-being of the child, puberty. If the child has an inflammatory disorder, the level will be low. But if you've excluded chronic illness, you will see that it is a good test. It has a high sensitivity for severe growth hormone deficiency, as you see on the left, and in non-growth hormone deficient patients, for example, having excluded chronic illness, you may well pick up children who might have growth hormone resistance. Now let me come back, I'm going to finish in a minute, to this question of committing to a diagnosis. After we've gone through this process, this diagnostic protocol, we need to be able to say that my patient the patient in front of me, is short because they have either severe growth hormone deficiency, and I'm one of the causes on this list. We have to commit ourselves. We have to make a decision. And having made that decision, we can then work with that diagnosis to determine our therapeutic strategy. Some final thoughts. As we know, growth hormone, uh, as we know, short stature has many etiologies. We need to have a classical approach. We need to listen, be attentive, be observant. We have to uh, use general investigations before endocrine investigations. And non-endocrine disorders must be excluded before we embark on the investigation of the growth hormone IGF-1 axis. The growth hormone stimulation test and basal IGF-1 are useful. And um, essentially, the investigations should lead to our commitment to a diagnosis, which will lead to logical 
consideration of therapy. Okay, so that's uh, my presentation. Let me move on. And let's, I just like to finish by coming back to the fact that we are clinicians, we are pediatricians, and the diagnostic approach to short stature is more an art, more like a painting by the Dutch painter Vermeer than a diagram by the technical but brilliant um, inventor Galileo. So, a multiple choice question. Okay, here we are. General screening tests can exclude which of the following conditions? And can you select, can you select the answer which you think is correct? Okay, I'm going to give you a few moments to think about this. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> okay. So, um, was there anything? Uh, we're just going to a small technical glitch here. Okay. Any any <laughs> anything you'd like to pick up on on my presentation at all? We can just get get talking. Um, I think that was brilliant. I mean, we need to understand that it's an art rather than a science. Okay. Not so technical. Right. Look at the patient. That's Look at the very patient. Important. Yes, I think that's, that's uh, an important. I learned that from Professor Tanner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was fortunate to work with Professor Tanner, mm -hmm. and he was a great observer. Yes. So here we have, um, okay. Okay, excellent. Well, you did very well. You did wow. very well in your questions. Yeah. And over 70% said all of the above, which is absolutely the right answer. Yeah. So well done. So let's, uh, let's move on. And now I'm going to hand over to, to Han Wook. And his topic of his presentation is heightism and the psychological burden of short stature. Han Wook. Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, I'm going to speak about heightism and psychological burden of short stature. This is my disclosures. Many years ago, I had a chance to evaluate is what is the real cause of the individuals with the chief complaint of short stature referred to our clinic. It turns out that most of them are normal stature, actually, and the rest of 30% is a short stature. But furthermore, most of them are idiopathic short stature caused by familiar or constitutional or combined of a family and constitutional uh, short stature. The pathologic condition is only a little bit higher than 13%. Still, nowadays, many Korean parents are very much eager to improve their children's height. They are so much worried about their kids' stature. Why is that? I think this is because of the heightism. What is heightism? In 1971, the term heightism was coined by sociologist Sir Felden, which is a prejudice or discrimination against the individual based on height in terms of employment or even dating or job opportunity seeking. And this discriminatory treatment is really is not within the normal range in population, usually in a short individuals rather than taller individual. The interesting uh, question questionnaire based survey was done in us many years ago. Uh, including over 3,000 high school children, and they questioned, do they really satisfied with their current height? Surprisingly, half of them are not satisfied with their current height. 
So they ask, ask again, how tall you want to be? In boys and girls, they expect their final adult height way high above the average Korean adult men and women. This is another questionnaire-based survey of girls promoting remedies, including over 800 children. In fact, one-third of the children had tried some growth promotion remedies. Many uh, has taken over medication and health-promoting supplements, probably calcium or multivitamin. Even 3% of individuals have received growth hormone therapy. There are so many websites disseminating the information about growth. And the, in this diagram, so mainly this uh, information have been provided by the oriental medicine uh, or commercial sectors. Only 60% of information has been given by academic society. Here, if you search the internet, there are so many different kinds of so-called height-promoting remedies, height-promoting shoes, height-promoting machine to stretch your back, and a growth enhancer, where which component is really scientifically proven effect. And there are so many advertising websites for limb lengthening surgery and chiropractic, martial art, or oriental medicine. There are many, many reports on the influence of short teacher on the social, emotional, and behavioral functioning. Let me take several literature result here. Though the short children from a population-based sample reported a marginally higher levels of self-perceived peer victimization, but they do not differ from their non-short peers in a range of social, emotional, and behavioral outcomes. Another report describes there was no significant differences in peer ratings of friendship, popularity, or reputation for short children. Another report said that there was no significant psychosocial adjustment problems in clinic-based study. There were higher rates of internalizing and externalizing behavioral problems and lower social, social competence among children referred to a large pediatric endocrinology clinic. This is kind of a little bit a negative finding. However, it remains to be determined whether the growth hormone treatment significantly impacts quality of life in children with idiopathic short stature. What are the adverse influences of heightism? Of course, it discriminates and stigmatizes normal healthy children only based on height. Also, it medicalizes the healthy short children. We are not practicing plastic endocrinology. Many Korean parents are spending exuberant expenditure on futile treatment without scientific and clinical evidences. In case of idiopathic short stature, you really want to increase your kid's height or final adult height uh, to one inch, you may spend 35,000 $35, US dollars. Huge economic burden. So in summary, prejudice against short stature and favor for those taller in stature are discriminating short people in a variety of areas, particularly during adolescence. Most scientific literature agree that the psychosocial, emotional, and behavioral functioning of individuals who are shorter than average is largely indistinguishable from others, whether in childhood, adolescence, or adulthood. So, scrupulous caution 
for the prescription, prescription of recombinant human growth hormone is needed to avoid the medicalization of normal health issues of children. Thank you. Thank you very much, Han Wook. That's a very important uh, presentation yes, and really true. gives evidence of a lot of the pressures related to short stature, particularly as we've heard in an ambitious and emerging uh, economy. And uh, here is... Uh, so I'm going to close my talk uh, showing this picture and uh, giving a question to you. Is short stature really handicapped? You need to seriously think about. Okay? So this is my question for you. What are the adverse influences of heightism? Number one, it discriminates normal short stature children based on stature alone. Number two, it stigmatizes normal short children. Number three, it medicalizes healthy normal stature children, often resulting in exuberant spending of growth hormone therapy. Four, all of the above, five, none of the above. Very easy question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so please t just take a few moments to think about that, and uh, we'll get the answer. I'll get the answer through, through, <coughs> through, through my headphone. Let me ask you, Han Wook, is this uh, a problem which you come across in your daily practice when you see patients referred? Mm -hmm. yeah, I, have been, I have been in this field for more than a quarter of a century, actually. Yeah. So when I first published the, the uh, first paper in yes. the uh, screen of the cause of the short stage, yes. still nowadays many parents are still eager to, to improve their kids' height. Yes. And now s our societies are getting more competitive, yes. yeah. particularly in looking yes. appearance. Yes. <laughs> maybe, yes. Yes. maybe by the influence of media or yeah. other yeah. things. Yeah. I think this situation is similar in other Asian Pacific yeah. regions. Sure. Mm. Right. Yeah. Okay, so everybody got the answer right. Wow. Everybody got the right oh, answer. Okay. Well, okay. Okay. So maybe wonderful. your questions were a little bit too easy. <laughs> yeah. You well, did very my, well. My message will come across well. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so well done. So thank you very much. So we should move on now. And uh, now I hand over to Yazid. And he's going to talk about a problem which is of extreme importance in this part of the world. And that is nutritional status in the assessment of short stature. Yazid. Thank you, Martin. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for joining us for this webinar. I will be talking on the nutritional status in the assessment of short stature. And this is my disclosure. So let's just look at the normal growth pattern. I think when we talk about uh, normal growth in children, we need to understand that children grow at different rate during different time of the period of growth. In the first two years of life, uh, usually, this is the most rapid growth in children. In the first year, it was estimated that the average height gain is about 20 to 25 centimeter, and at the second year, it's about 10 to 12 centimeter. By the age of five years, they double the height. And between the age of five to 10 years, most of these children will grow between five to seven centimeter per year. When they then go into height spurt during puberty, about for the duration of about two to three years before they end their height gain uh, at the end of the puberty. So for girls around the age of 15 and for boys around the age of 17 when they had the fusion of the epiphysis. We need to also understand that there are three different phases of growth in childhood which is the fetus and infancy period, uh, the childhood phase and as well as the adolescent phase. And for all these three different phases, nutrition play an important role, especially during the fetal and infancy period. It has been reported that during the infancy period, the percent of energy consumed that is used for growth is tremendous the during the first four months of life, can go up to about 27%. While when they are in their second year of life, the percentage of energy consumed is just about 1%. Hence, it, 
it is, it is very important for us to understand about nutrition when we talk about growth in children. Let's move to the first question that I have here. So you have a multiple choice question here on the uh, nutrition. All right. So nutrition plays a critical role in modulating levels and effects of hormones on the growth plate. Nutrition deficiency may not cause okay, increase in glucocorticoid level, decrease IGF-1, decrease FGF-21, increase thyroid hormone, decrease estrogen level. So which, are, which one do you think that the answer for this? So just take a moment to think about, uh, to think about this question. Nutritional deficiency may not cause these uh, options. Just take a moment to think about that. And then I'll get the answer over the, over the phone. So wh why don't you carry on? Uh All right. Okay, so let's move on. So the next one, we'll look into this nutrition. Yeah. Nutrition plays a critical role in the modulating levels and effects of hormones on the growth plate. Uh, we know that when you have nutrition deficiency, there will be an increase in glucocorticoid. There will be a decrease in estrogen due to the effect of the leptin. And as well, there will be a reduction in thyroid hormone and reduction in IGF-1. All these have a negative impact on the growth plate chondrocyte. On the other hand, malnutrition will also induce growth hormone insensitivity, partially through FGF-21. And because of that, there is an increase in FGF-21, which then lead to the reduction in IGF-1, which then lead to the negative impact on growth plate chondrocyte and causes the child to have short stature. All right. So when let, we talk... Let, let me just give All you right. the answer of the question okay. that mm -hmm. everybody answered number four, which that it does not cause increased thyroid hormone. Yes, yes. it does. That's the right answer. Correct. Okay. Well very done, everybody. Good. Very well. You're paying attention. Very good. <laughs> Carry on, uh, Yaziz. Okay. So when we look at nutritional status, we need to do certain assessment. And those assessment involve looking at the anthropometric variables. And we also need to look into the feeding practice, looking at whether there's any red flags related to feeding practice, as well as looking at the assessment of the intake by looking at the total calories and also energy expenditure. Let me just go into a bit more detail on the subsequent slides when we talk about the assessment. Right, so there is this, what we call as the ABC of assessing growth and nutrition. Uh, this involves looking at the anthropometry, looking at the biochemical measures, as well as clinical observations. Further slides will give you more detail of that. So when we look at anthropometric variables, it is important for us to understand that we need to do serial measurements, not just at one point in terms of looking at the height, the weight, the head circumference, looking at BMI, looking at skin fold measurement. And because of that, we need to compare to the standard growth charts. And if you do have your own country-specific growth chart, that will be the best. If you, however, do not have that, the WHO growth chart will be the one that you want to use to, com to compare with the standards. Again, when we look at nutritional assessment, it is very important for us to understand about these two different definitions, which is stunting <coughs> and wasting, nicely depicted on the pictorial uh, diagram on the right. So we need to understand stunting. Stunting means that there is this height for each z-score, which is less than minus two standard deviation, and wasting, which is weight for height z-score, less than minus two standard deviation. This two is very important in terms of looking at the growth of a child. Right, so when we talk about the physical examination, it has been mentioned by Martin just now, we need to really look at the patient. And in this nutritional assessment, very important that we need to look at certain sites for us to then look into the possible deficiency, whether in terms of the mineral or even vitamins. Uh, for instance, if you look at the skin of the child, we need to understand whether there is any pallor, there is any dry, scaly skin, or even dermatitis that can tell you the possible deficiency. And I'm not going to go through each one of them, but suffice to tell you that it's important for us to look at the skin, the nails, the neck, 
the mouth, the eyes, the abdomen, the hair, as well as the musculoskeletal. Right, so what are the biochemical measures that we need to use to assess nutritional status in children? So is it, it is important for us to look at electrolyte measures so that we can identify whether there's any fluid imbalance. We need to look at the serum iron ferritin, uh, red blood cell distribution as well as the hemoglobin so that we can detect iron deficiency. And again, we need to look at the C-reactive protein and cytokines to identify the presence of inflammation. Right. Again, when we look at feeding practices, it is important for us to be concerned, especially if we find something in the otherwise well child. These are what we call as red flags. One of the things is that looking at whether there's any prolonged breastfeeding or bottle feeding more than two years, prolonged meal time more than 30 minutes every meal, there's disruptive and stressful meal time, there need to be distraction to increase the intake, and more importantly, to look at the parental concerns whether the parents themselves agree that there is any issues with rela related to the food variety. Nutritional assessment should also include calorie assessment. This needs to be done because we need to understand whether the child is getting sufficient or insufficient calorie by looking at the type of the calories consumed and whether the child is taking all the four main food groups, basically the dairy, the cereals, the meat, in terms of all the proteins that the child takes, as well as the fruits and vegetables. How do we evaluate this? This can be done by a few measures. One of them is the 24-hour diet recall. The other one is uh, using the three-day food diary, including two weekday and one weekends. We also need to understand and look at the number of meal times, the food variety and the food quantity, as well as the food texture. I would like to also introduce a few other things here, the dietary diversity score, as well as food variety score, for us to understand whether this, this child is taking enough or not enough day to day. All right, so when we intervene, we need to intervene when there is a crossing down across two center lines, if there is inadequate growth or weight gain for more than one month in a child less than two years, or if there is any weight loss or no weight gain for a period of three months or more in a child of more than two years, or if the tri tricep skin fold is less than five, fifth percentile for age. So in conclusion, it is very important for <coughs> us to understand here that child's growth reflects general health. Nutrition is key for optimum growth. Nutritional deficiency causes hormonal imbalance, which may lead to poor growth. Nutritional assessment includes looking at serial anthropometric measurements, Key screening questions on feeding practice is important, looking for the red flags, assessment of nutritional intake and expenditure is very important, and early detection will help us to minimize the impact of any underlying health condition and then again optimize the adult height. Excellent. Thank you very much, Yazid. Thank that was a brilliant presentation. Very nice indeed. So now I think we, we should move on and we're now going to look about, we're going to talk about growth hormone treatment. And uh, as you know, growth hormone treatment for idiopathic short stature is quite a controversial topic. It is licensed in the United States. It is not licensed in Europe. But it's going to be very helpful for us to hear from Han Wook now about growth hormone treatment of idiopathic short stature in a multi- Center National Study here in Korea. Han Wook. Okay, I'm back again. Um, in this short presentation, I'd like to introduce several growth hormone treatment of uh, idiopathic short stature in Korean multi center national study. This is my disclosure. As you, all of you are well aware of, the idiopathic short stature is defined based on uh, followings. They must be very short. Their height is under the minus 2 SDS for Asian sex. They don't have any evidence of systemic endocrine and nutritional or chromosomal abnormalities. Uh, when they were born, they are normal size. They are sufficient in growth hormone secretion. 
And this condition, actually, heterogeneous group consisting of many presently unidentified cause of short stature. Nowadays, the underlying molecular mechanisms are growingly, grow increasingly understood. For instance, is one of the most common molecular defect is a natriuretic peptide receptor mutation. However, the, the commonest cause of idiopathic short stature are family of short stature and the constitutional delay of growth and puberty. So what is family of short stature? Their parents, one or uh, either, or both parents are very short and their birth size is normal. They born normal size, but eventually they fall on the, the third percentile by the, by the end of first and second year after birth. Then their pupil, uh, growth velocity is pretty normal, and their pupillary onset is normal, and bone age is appropriate for uh, their calendar age. How about constitutional delay of growth and puberty? <clears throat> They have a similar family, family history. One of their parents have, uh, is uh, late bloomers. That means their puberty developed very later on their age. And they, uh, they are birth size normal. But at a certain point, they are very short. And, uh, they are uh, growth rate decelerated during first and second year of life. And puberty and bone age are remarkably delayed for their calendar age. They have a normal predicted adult height, uh, but uh, final adult, adult height of uh, CDGP often do not reach their uh, normal predicted adult height. So several clinical studies uh, of growth hormone therapy efficacy in idiopathic short stature have been conducted in our country. Uh, in this presentation, I would like to focus on this paper. This is a <clears throat> randomized phase three clinical trial for the uh, effect of growth hormone therapy on the uh, idiopathic short stature. This is, is the baseline demographic profile the treatment group is twice as many as control group, and the high estes is very short. They are young. Their baseline uh, height velocity is quite normal. They are sufficient in growth hormone secretion, and IGF estes is a little bit lower than uh, average. Here I summarize in this table. Uh, the left one is a somatotropin, uh, which was developed in domestic pharmaceutical company. The second one is the uh, if developed by a foreign pharmaceutical company, and the <clears throat> basically their study design is the same. The treatment group is they continuously received growth hormone therapy for one year, a control group six months period untreated period, then on the treatment for six months. And the, but here, you, I'd like to your attention to the growth hormone dose. Both studies, are use, both studies used a relatively high dose of growth hormone. It's maybe you, you, you usually this dose in a, uh, SGA or neural syndrome. And the, uh, to make long story short, the primary endpoint is the um, height velocity increment in the, compared to control group from the baseline to the end at the end of one year their height velocity is almost doubled five to ten centimeters in both groups during just for first first year of treatment this diagram illustrates the sequential change of I IGF-1 SDS and IGF-PP3 SDS from baseline at and six and 12 months of time point. Uh, the yellow, yellow line uh, is the, on the left side is the uh, treatment group. Of course, during the 
uh, treatment group, uh, the IGF-1 SDS continuously e is rising. Uh, the uh, red uh, line is the control group. For six months, they, are, they were not treated. Then later six months, they have been uh, treated with growth hormone, and the IGF-1 SDS is increased. And right side, it's not it's IGF BP3 SDS is same situation. Finally, I borrowed this slide from LZ growth study. Uh, it's, a, it's one of the biggest growth data set uh, uh, for the uh, safety or efficacy monitoring. It's been almost seven years, more than uh, 3,000 patients have been enrolled in, play in this data set. According to this data database, the about 15% of the patients uh, receiving growth hormone therapy under the indication of idiopathic short stature. So I'm closing my talk by asking which of the statements below is true for the Korean multi-center national studies and growth hormone therapy in idiopathic, idiopathic short stature? Number one, number of subjects are relatively large. Number two, study duration is long, longer than three years. Number three, a relatively higher dose of recombinant human growth hormone has been administered with increment of height gain for the first year of therapy. Number four, changes in metabolic profiles have been thoroughly investigated. Please Ex vote. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and Wu, <coughs> beautiful presentation, very clear, and some very important messages. So please take a, a moment to answer these questions, think about them, and... Um, we're going to move on because I want to leave time at the end for Q&A and discussion. So we're going to move on and I'll get the results. Uh, already I have it. 100% say number three. Good. Okay. So you're a very good audience. You're all agreeing with each other, which is, which is remarkable. And I think that just speaks to the clarity of Han Wook's presentation. So let's move on to uh, my presentation. No, I'm sorry, we'll go back to, to Yazid. And now we're going to talk about a specific problem highly relevant, particularly in Malaysia, the management of children with short stature and thalassemia. Yazid. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Uh, again, hello uh, for continuing to join us this morning. I will talk to you on the management of children with short stature and thalassemia. Again, this is my disclosure. So when we talk about thalassemia, we need to understand a little bit about uh, what thalassemia means. So thalassemia is a defective uh, problem of the alpha and beta globin subunits of the hemoglobin. And this is a most common inherited single gene disorder with a high incidence of between 2.5 to 25% in the Mediterranean basin, the Middle East, the tropical and subtropical regions of Africa, the Asian subcontinent as well as in Southeast Asia. This is a highly burden of disease with 240,000 infants annually being detected to have thalassemia with around 190 million carriers worldwide. Uh, what happens is that in thalassemia major, there will be ineffective erythropoiesis which lead to bone marrow expansion to 20 times normal levels with RBC maturation, maturation arrest which lead to growth retardation, increase in blood volume, as well as increased gastrointestinal iron absorption with characteristic bone changes. Let's look at these children with transfusion-dependent thalassemia. It is well documented that the life expectancy of these children are now getting better. Over the last 40 years, the life expectancy in 1970 was put at 17 years of age, but now in year 2000, they can live up to about 47 years. That's really a good improvement. And in Malaysia, we see that those who live by the age of 40, 
in year 2005, there's about 65% of them. But in year 2014, it has increased to about 80% who can live until the age of 40s. So the survival probability is really improving. And when we talk about that, we need to understand that there are some thalassemia-associated complications related to the anemia itself and then also associated with transfusions. When we talk about the association with anemia, we need to understand about growth delay, about the extramedullary hematopoiesis leading to splenomegaly as well as skeletal changes. Transfusion-associated complications will include the siderosis, which then leads to the problem in the liver, the heart, and endocrine organs, as well as some degree of infection related to transfusions. All right, so what are the endocrine dysfunction that is related to transfusion-dependent thalassemia? This is mainly related to the chronic iron overload itself, which lead to the involvement of the pituitary gland, pancreas, and parathyroid. From the pituitary gland, it will also affect the gonads, the growth hormone and IGF-1 axis, thyroid gland as well as adrenal gland, leading to all this problem of hypoparathyroidism, hypogonadism, short stature, hypothyroidism, hypocortisolism, as well as impact glucose homeostasis. All this will impact definitely the height of the child. All right, let's just look at some of the data that has been published. I just want you to concentrate on the one in the red box coming from the Thalassemia International Federation. Uh, this is quite a long, about 15 years back data, but it involved quite a very good number of patients. Here you can see that um, out of that 3,800 patients involved, 30% have short stature, with 7% of them has growth hormone deficiency. Hypogonadism involved about 40% of them, primary hypothyroid in 3%, and hypoparathyroid in about 7% of them. All this definitely will affect the growth and the height of the child. When we look at the timing of complication, growth failure occurs very early, even before the age of five years. And when the child goes into adolescent period, the pubertal delay and hypothyroidism makes the short stature worse. So let's go on to the question here. Mm. So my question to you is that short stature in transfusion-dependent thalassemia may be related to A, chronic anemia, to under nutrition, three chronic iron overload that may lead to hypothyroidism, three platyspondylosis as a result of iron chelation therapy, and five all of the above. So let's look at that and put your answer to it. Yep. Take a few mm -hmm. moments to think about these questions, and uh, and then we'll come back with uh, with your answers. Okay. Carry on, Yazid. All right. Thank you, Martin. So I will move on to the factors that may lead to growth failure. If you look at this, uh, growth failure can be multifactorial. The one in the light blue tells you that the factors are in involving the transfusion-related iron overload and chelation of uh, the uh, thalassemia patients themselves. And the one in the dark green is related directly to thalassemia itself, which is chronic anemia, psychosocial stress and undernutrition. Here you can see when there is transfusion-related iron overload, patient may have chronic liver disease, growth hormone deficiency, hypothyroidism, and hypogonadism, And all this will lead to short stature. Okay, so basically I have the result of the voting, and everybody said all of the above. Yes, <laughs> absolutely right. Thank well you. Done. So you've been listening. Okay. <laughs> So the growth failure in thalassemia patient involves three different phases. And if you, we look at here, the, the, the first phase, which is the young uh, children uh, time, yeah, there will be anemia. Be, sorry, go on. So there will be anemia, hypoxia or nutrition deficiency that lead to the growth problem in the first phase uh, of growth. And during childhood, there will be some degree of anemia and iron overload that may lead to growth hormone IGF-1 axis dysregulation that will further cause the short stature in these children. And during puberty, during the adolescent period, the hypogonadism makes the short stature worse. And of 165 patients had, that had been looked into, 
about 50% of men and 64% of female achieve the 10th centile height. All right. The other reason why there is short stitch is that there is the presence of sh truncal shortening, about 15 to 40% of them. And this is mainly related to hypogonadism itself or even the platyspondylosis related to desferoxamine toxicity. In view of this short stature, the uh, Thalassemia International Federation has came up with a guideline that there is a need to really manage this group of children to avoid short stature. One of the uh, parameters is that to look into the adequate blood transfusion and keeping the pre-transfusion hemoglobin to be more than 90 gram per liter, the post-transfusion hemoglobin more than 130 gram per liter, and also to optimize the iron chelation by starting iron chelation when ferritin level is more than 1,000 and keeping serum ferritin level between 500 to 1,000 by using different iron chelators, whether it's subcutaneously or by oral deferiprone. And there is a need to give some zinc supplement to help them to avoid their spon uh, platyspondylosis. Annual endocrine screening is important from the age of 10 years and the hypogonadism gonadism screening by the age of 12. So let's just look at the prevalence of growth hormone deficiency. Out of 165 patients seen in one of the report, it has been shown that 34% of them has short stature, but growth hormone deficiency do occur in 6% of them. And in a, in a bigger multi-center study involving 3,800 patients, 7.9% male and 8.8% female had growth hormone deficiency. So what do we do to these children with growth hormone deficiency? There are some data to show us the effect of growth hormone therapy in this group of children. And if you look at the last two columns on the right, the growth velocity before and after growth hormone treatment, you can see that there is some improvement. There is a modest improvement in growth velocity itself from 2.5 to about 5.5 in one of the study, from 2.5 to about 6.3 centimeter one year later, and the median of be before the treatment of 3.8 to about 6.9 centimeter. So the growth velocity do improve. There's some improvement, there's modest improvement in growth velocity before and after the treatment with growth hormone. So, so in conclusion, uh, when we talk about thalassemia, it is important for us to understand that Thalassemia-associated complications are associated with cro chronic anemia and also iron overload, secondary to blood transfusion itself. The poor growth can be due to chronic anemia, transfusion-related iron overload, psychosocial effects and undernutrition. The late endocrine effects may be minimized by intensive iron chelation and all transfusion-dependent thalassemia patients should have an annual endocrine screening from the age of 10. Brilliant. Thank you very much, uh, Yazid. Very clear presentation, full of very important practical advice. Now, I'd like to move on because uh, I want to leave time at the end for, for discussion. The questions will come in. And I'd like to hear, uh, hear the question through my earpiece. Um, so we're going, to, we're going to move on. And... I'll just give a short presentation on factors influencing the response to growth hormone therapy. So why does growth hormone treatment help children to grow? Well, basically, growth hormone stimulates the growth plate and you can see the production and the development of the chondrocyte, which is the key cell for linear growth in children in the growth plate. And it's either growth hormone itself, which stimulates the very uh, primitive stem cells to, to develop, or through IGF-1, which uh, stimulates the proliferation, hypertrophy, and also the calcification of these cartilage cells in the growth plate. And this is the way children increase their height, because this happens in the long bones and also in the spine. 
So we know that growth hormone treatment is effective. But what are the aims of this treatment? It's got to be efficacious. We've got to think about adherence. It's got to be safe. It should be patient-friendly. In other words, it should be well-tolerated. And it should be cost-effective. Now, where are we today in 2019 with growth hormone therapy? Well, you have to look back to the history. Essentially, everything changed in 1985. In 19, up till 1985, we were treating children with small available quantities of pituitary-derived growth hormone. In 1985, there was the global epidemic of Jakob Creutzfeldt disease and treatment with uh, extracted pituitary growth hormone was discontinued. Fortunately, recombinant growth hormone had been developed by that time. And basically, from that point on, these uh, conditions were rapidly approved, starting with growth hormone deficiency, chronic renal insufficiency, Turner syndrome, Prader-Willi syndrome, small for gestational age, children, idiopathic short stature, Shock's deficiency, and Noonan syndrome. And so there was an explosion of indications for treatment with growth hormone. But if you look at the list of these indications, what strikes one is the fact that there is a broad range of sensitivities. What do we mean by sensitivity? What we mean is the ability of tissues in the body to respond to growth hormone. So that can be called responsiveness. And there is a range of responsiveness across all these different conditions. And we see this if we look at the, the graph, which is known as the continuum model of growth hormone IGF-1 axis defects. And if you look at the graph, essentially there are two axes. On the x-axis, you have responsiveness to growth hormone increasing towards the right. And on the y-axis, you have growth hormone secretion. And if we look at the most responsive Children, these are children with extreme growth hormone deficiency. They are highly responsive and they have low secretion. We then move up through the disorders. We have a milder growth hormone deficiency. And then we move to idiopathic short stature. And we've heard from Han Yuk Wook that basically these children can respond, but they need higher doses of growth hormone to do so. And then we move to growth hormone resistance. And if you look at the doses of growth hormone, which I've shown on the bottom of the slide, we start by treating severe growth hormone deficiency with a small replacement dose. Milder growth hormone deficiency, we increase the dose a little bit. And then for idiopathic short stature, we increase the dose even more. So as the responsiveness decreases, the dose of growth hormone increases to produce uh, a meaning, meaningful response. And the range of responsiveness can be shown in this slide, where you have two children, both with growth hormone deficiency. But on the left, you have the little boy. You can see he has a very immature face. He's a, a four-year-old. He has extreme short stature. I performed myself, at some risk, I have to say, mm -hmm. uh, an insulin tolerance test on this child and he could not make any growth hormone, despite severe hypoglycemia. However, fortunately, he survived the test. Um, and basically, here you have extreme growth hormone deficiency, which is very rare. We don't see many of these children these days. We see many children, like the little boy on the right, who was short. You can see he's shorter than his brother. Uh, basically, he has a peak growth hormone on glucagon stimulation of... 4.8 micrograms per liter, which is less than 7, which is our cutoff for growth hormone deficiency. So here you have severe growth hormone deficiency and mild growth hormone deficiency. So look at their responsive response to growth hormone. On the left, we treated with a small replacement dose of growth hormone, and he grew 15 centimeters in the first year. On the right, we gave double the dose of growth hormone, he grew nine centimeters. So this just tells us 
that there is this range of responsiveness. And we have to take all this into consideration. And I've shown here, or I've tried to show, how that in severe growth hormone deficiency, we give a small replacement dose, and the children are very responsive. It's, it's a bit like rowing a boat across a lake, which is flat, calm. You can row very, very fast with great ease. If you look on the right, and we are now treating children who do not have growth hormone deficiency, but nevertheless, they are licensed to be treated with growth hormone. They have SGA, Turner syndrome, or Noonan syndrome. They need a higher dose of growth hormone, which is not a replacement dose, but it has a pharmacological effect. And here we're working, when we row the boat, we're working against the wind in rough sea, and it is much more difficult. And these children are much less responsive. So this tells us that, I've skipped one slide, let me go back. Okay, another factor is adherence. It has now become clear, and there is increasingly good scientific data to show that adherence is generally poor in many patients. Up to 60% of patients may miss one dose per week, and we know that, su that the success of growth hormone therapy is dependent on the patient's ability to adhere to their treatment regimen. Because of the wide range of sensitivities, we now know that growth hormone treatment has to be individualized for each child. What does that mean? It means that the dose of growth hormone should be calculated for each child according to the factors which predict the growth response in that child. And in 1999, the first prediction model of growth hormone therapy came in. It was published by Michael Ranke, and uh, it has evolved since then, but the basic message is still there. And if you look at the column idiopathic growth hormone deficiency, you will see that the number one predictor is the degree of growth hormone deficiency. And then you have dose, and then you have age. But if you look at the non-growth hormone deficient indications, Turner syndrome, SGA, or idiopathic short stature, you immediately focus on the fact that the number one predictor of response is dose. So that's why the dose needs to be modified and individualized in each child. Do we use the prediction model in our clinics? This is the science, and this is the clinic. And the answer is that there is a disconnect. I mean, no clinician really has time to enter all the individual data shown on the left and come up with a dose of growth hormone to be used. So the principle is there, but unfortunately the practice is, is very different. So, should we use prediction models? The model may be difficult to use in the clinic. Should we learn the factors used to calculate growth predictions? The answer is yes. So this is what we have to take on board. As a result of all the clever mathematics involved in the prediction model, we have to get the message that the key factors influencing growth in children with growth hormone treatment are diagnosis, in other words, sensitivity, mm -hmm. age, in growth hormone deficiency, the severity of the deficiency, mm -hmm. the height of the parents, <coughs> the dose of growth <coughs> hormone, and then the growth response in the first year of therapy, which was clearly shown in uh, Han Wook's presentation on idiopathic short stature. So, that really sums up the, uh, the formal presentations. 
Uh, we've heard some very, very nice presentations from Han Wook and from Yazid. We've covered a wide range of topics, idiopathic short stature, nutrition, thalassemia, heightism, prejudice, the psychological burden of short stature. And now I think we have some, we have maybe 15 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes for, for questions. And I'm going to wait for the questions to come to me through my uh, earpiece. And as I'm waiting for that, I want to ask you, uh, Han Wook, it's very interesting that the children with idiopathic short stature grew so well. Mm -hmm. And yet, in some parts of the world, for instance, in Europe, it was not approved. Mm -hmm. now, I think possibly the reason, I think there's maybe a financial reason for that. But uh, are you, generally speaking, happy treating children with idiopathic short stature with growth hormone? Uh, it depends on individual. Their yeah. parents' target height is uh, very tall, and the bone age is uh, remarkably delayed. Yes. Also, the kids' body weight is very important, I think. It's yes. very so in those cases, the growth hormone responsiveness is very good. It's very good, yeah. yes. 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 We are treating them for several years, but compared to first year, the second year are a little bit yeah. waned. Yes, yeah. interesting. But so we need to raise the dose. Yes. Anyway, anyway they will gain in high, uh, the height and weight. So. Yes, but yes. But if the parents' height is very short, I mean, target height is very short. Yes. In those cases, oh, some we uh, have some disappointing, disappointing result. Yes. The second and third year. Yes, I think that is a very <coughs> important message mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. often uh, families where the parents are short and they may have themselves have suffered themselves mm -hmm. in childhood mm -hmm. and then they have a child who is rather short and, of course, they feel... They're, they're concerned about mm -hmm. the, the psychological welfare mm -hmm. of the child because they, have, they themselves have been through a stressful time. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the point you make is that the short children of very short parents often have a poor response to growth hormone. Yeah. And that really is a very important point mm -hmm. when, when you're considering mm -hmm. which children with idiopathic short stature to treat. As Han Wook says, it is the children of tall parents who do best, and the children of short parents often have a disappointing yes, result. Yes. Mm. I have a question coming through. Okay. Right, okay, so we have a question here. What is the value of random growth hormone or IGF-1 levels in the assessment of short stature. Would you like to take that, Yazid? Okay, so when we look at, I think random growth hormone does not give you much information. Mm -hmm. So you need to do a proper stimulation test yes. uh, to ascertain the level of growth hormone, the maximum growth hormone level before you say that is deficient, insufficient or sufficient. Yes. So I don't think, I mean, random, gro random growth hormone level is not it. A stimulation it's has not to be helpful. There. It's not helpful. Not helpful. Yeah. Okay. IGF one, I consider it helpful. Yes. But it needs to be done at the few different timing. Yes. It cannot be done just once because yes. it is affected by a lot of factors, as you mentioned yes. earlier. Yes. So if we can see whether there's any increasing in trend or whether it's decreasing in trend, that may tell us something. Yes. So IGF one yes. is still beneficial. Yes. To be looked at. Yes. But would you say it's really only helpful if you, if you know the growth hormone level? Because shouldn't it be uh, interpreted together with, with the, the peak growth okay. hormone from a stimulation test? Yeah. If you find an IGF-1 level which is low on its own, yeah. you don't know if it's due to decreased secretion of growth hormone or possibly resistance Under to growth hormone exactly. mm -hmm. or other... Yep. Other factors. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. I, I do agree. So you need to do both around about the same the same time. It's not just IGF one standalone. Yes. Because we know IGF one can be affected by 
if there is any liver disease, yeah. like in thalassemia, yeah, absolutely. you may have a low IGF-1. Yes. Mm. You may also have low IGF-1 because of poor nutrition mm -hmm. itself, yes. Yes. as I showed earlier. Yes. So there's a need for us to try to put <coughs> things together, right. not just stand alone on its own. Right, right. I mean, yeah. that's a very important point. IGF-1 cannot really be interpreted as a sort of single finding on its Correct. own. You need to look at the status of the patient, nutrition, whether there's any chronic inflammation or liver disease at the same time. So it's, it's important. And then, of course, there's the issue of the laboratory measurement. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yes. And the laboratory that measures IGF-1 should give you a normal range Correct. for yeah. the child mm -hmm. that you're, you're studying. Correct. And there are relatively few reference laboratories for yes. IGF-1 um, in, in the world, in yes. fact. I mean, mm -hmm. there are some in Europe, mm -hmm. but we're very dependent on the mm -hmm. assay, the accuracy right. of the mm -hmm. assay. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. that's a good point. And, and the range, uh, may I uh, just add, the, the range is actually different pre-pubertal and pubertal. The older and the younger yes. age group, they are yes. different. So yes. that's why one needs to interpret based on that range rather than just looking at just that no one number. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I have another question coming in. <laughs> right, okay, the question is, mm -hmm. has growth hormone ever been offered, or let me turn it around to say, has it been effective in children with skeletal dysplasia? Right. The dysplasia. Yeah. <laughs> I know that in Japan, yes, yes. chondroplasia and hypochondroplasia were indicated for growth hormone therapy. Yes. yes, but for the first couple of years, they seem to be responsive. But uh, eventually, yes. to my feeling, it doesn't influence their final adult height. Right. Instead, right. nowadays right. the clinical study is undergoing. Right. So with uh, uh, clinical phase three from the company, it's a kind of a the other signal analog, yes. so called C naturally 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 really peptide yes. Yes. analog. Yes. Yes. Which yes. I think that is much more promising in the future. Okay. Yes. Rather than growth hormone therapy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right. I mean I think I think that's a very balanced uh, reply that there are new uh, molecular preparations being mm -hmm. prepared which actually will help cartilage development yeah. at the mm -hmm. site of the growth plate, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is yeah. really where the defect is. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because I think, uh, for example, in, in Europe, we don't use growth hormone for skeletal dysplasia. We have to respect the fact that in, in Japan that there is uh, a license. We have to respect mm -hmm. that. And personally, I think I've used it in one or two children during puberty mm -hmm. who've had hypochondroplasia okay. and mm -hmm. have shown a little mm -hmm. bit of response. <coughs> But by and large, I, th I think the response is relatively disappointing mm, yeah. in skeletal dysplasia. And we have to look to the next generation mm -hmm. of, uh, of mm, molecules, molecules yeah. that, that, that can... Yeah, there are so many different kinds of skeletal dysplasia. I'm just yes. focused on echondroplasia and hypochondroplasia. Yes. But in the very extreme rare case of uh, Schacht's deficiency, there's mm. very well osteochondral disorders. Yes, yes. That's indicated for growth hormone therapy. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. It's a good point. Yeah, yeah. It's a good point. In shocks deficiency, this is actually a licensed indication. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because of the defect of shocks. Yes, yeah. yes, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. yes. Okay. Question from Malaysia coming okay. up. Okay. All right. <laughs> Well, it's a rather broad question. Okay. Is there any alternative if growth homo hormone therapy fails? Now, I'm not sure yeah. what condition he's referring in, in, in to. This condition, yeah. um, but I think, you know, if you are treating a child with non growth hormone deficient short mm. stature, it's very important as, the, as a doctor to be honest and open and to say to the family, right. I am not sure yes. to what extent this treatment is going to benefit your yes. child. Agree. If you, um, if you are open and honest about it, yeah. then, and you look carefully at the growth response, if the growth response 
turns out to be disappointing, then you can stop, discontinue the treatment without losing face. <laughs> Absolutely agree. And, and yes. you know, doctors, doctors don't like to be proved wrong, yes. <laughs> but the fact that you've been, you've been open in the first place, exactly. you, yes. it gives you the option of actually <laughs> stopping. <laughs> And I think that, that uh, the slide that uh, Han, Han Yuk Wook sh showed with, with the tree falling on the cars, yeah. you know, we have to be <laughs> honest how much of a disadvantage in life mm -hmm. is short stature, yeah. particularly marginal short stature. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And there is no point treating a child, continuing with injections which are invasive and expensive, if there is no response. No response. Mm -hmm. Correct. So we have to yeah. be responsible. If there is no response, we have to yes. have the courage to say we're going to stop mm -hmm. and then obviously give, give the patient as much psychological support uh, as we can. Yeah. Agreed. Yep. Coming. Okay, last question, and that's a, it's a good one, is when should growth hormone be discontinued? At what point in linear growth should yeah. growth hormone be discontinued? Mm. Do you want to take that? Uh, when? And Wook? When, when should you stop? To stop. Yeah. When, should you, <coughs> when is it time to stop? Yeah. Uh, theoretically, in, in different disease conditions, theoretically in growth hormone deficiency, and uh, if the patient doesn't grow Two, two to three centimeters per year, then means that he or yeah. she reached the final growth height. Yes. Then just stop it. But the yes. technically in Korea, the nationwide insurance system do not reimburse once the patient's taller than 160. But now they raise the ceiling, 165 okay. centimeters for adult male. Right. Wow. And the female, it used to be 150, but they raised the ceiling up to 157 Interesting. Uh, for uh, growth hormone deficiency, return, or whatever the indication is. Uh, Interesting. Wow. Interesting. Yeah. Yes. But in idiopathic short teacher, and uh, it, we recommend long-term management if the, once the, the yes. patients are responsive. Right. So right. Right. So I just recommend the growth hormone therapy up until they reach the final growth height, yes. bone age, based on bone age and the yes. previous yes. year height velocity. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. Okay. I think that's yeah. that, that's a, that's a very valuable yeah. comment. Okay. Good. Well, I think it's time. Our time has unfortunately run out. <laughs> uh, it's been a real pleasure to have you with us on on this webinar. I'd like to thank Good. my two really excellent colleagues and speakers. Thank you, thank you for your, your, you, your beautiful, pleasure. beautiful yeah. presentation. And uh, yeah, we're going to have post-assessment questions, okay. which I think are going to come up now, uh, just before we finally close. Are we going to see them on the screen? Oh, I need to click. Sorry. Right. Okay. okay. <laughs> I need to click. Post-assessment questions, right. Which of the following are the most useful endocrine tests? These are the ones which uh, mm -hmm. we said at the beginning. Um, okay, and the uh, following factors should be taken into consideration when choosing growth hormone dose, age diagnosis, etc. Mm -hmm. And which of the following is true? And you have the uh, questions mm -hmm. at the bottom. So please take time to uh, answer those. We hope that what you've heard uh, in the lectures will help you to answer these questions correctly. So again, thank you for your help. It's thank been a pleasure you. and yeah. a privilege to be with you in <laughs> this live webinar. And we hope very much that it's going to help you with the management of your patients who have short stature. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>